what we're focusing on here today is net zero Wales. And it's mm. extraordinary that somebody who's this busy has been given such a ma mammoth task. But we are going to talk about net zero Wales 2035. And this is a question and answer session. I have a few questions to kick us off. Sadly, we have no electricity, so we can't see Jane's slides. But what we're going to do is if we suddenly get electricity, because it is brightening up dramatically, we will do some visuals at the end because there are some yeah. really good slides that kind of explain what's going on. So you'll have to reverse engineer this session in your mind. Um, OK, so I'm going to kick off, but I really want to see people's questions, to hear people's questions. And so please put your hand up. And if there are young people here, I will take your questions first if there are lots of hands up. So anyone under 30, if you want to ask a question, please put your hand up and I will go and come to you first. OK, right, I'm going to sit down, stop lecturing everyone. <laughs> Welcome, Jane. Right, uh, round of applause for being here, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you for being willing to come. Um, I know you have a really busy schedule. It's really brilliant to have you here. This is a very sophisticated audience, so you can I'm... take them as fast and as far as you like. It will be really great. So what I'd like to do first is just give you an opportunity to talk about Net Zero Wales and some of what's going on. And, and just say what you want this audience to know about it. I'm sorry you don't have your slides. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Um, hello, and thank, thanks all for coming. And I, I, I do hope that this... This is going to be uh, a sharing, not a lecturing session. That's, that's one of the things that, that all those of us who are in the room for the media session we've yeah, just had have learnt. And I think the other thing I want to say is, as a politician, I've never had any media training. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of ludicrous when you think about it. So all those of you who are here, um, who've just heard the most astonishing uh, kind of like, I've been writing down absolutely everything <laughs> because I still do a lot of radio and I'm thinking, my God, I wish I'd known that. Mm. So thank you very much. Uh, I've already gained so much out of this festival. Um, That's great. Yeah, the, first of all, how many people know about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act? Oh, wow. About Not half bad. the audience. Thank you so much. So, well, and, and do you know, if I went almost anywhere else, that would not be the case. Um, because the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act was passed in Wales in 2015. But the reason I'm sitting here with you now, as somebody who actually left politics in, in 2011, um, was because I spent all my political life trying to do sustainability in what was then the new National Assembly of Wales from 1999. And back in 1999, when Scotland got its government, when Northern Ireland got its assembly and Wales got its assembly, only Wales had a duty to promote sustainable development in everything that it did. And we were just really lucky, and politics is a lot about luck. We were really lucky that the people in the first government in Wales were passionate about sustainability. We had Rodri Morgan as a first minister who was passionate about sustainability and not only supported the idea about all our policies should be sustainable, but also he supported all the work I did in my first seven years as education minister to create a new curriculum that was focused on sustainability, that was focused on putting climate into curriculum for young learners. It was focused on working outdoors in the environment. My favorite headline ever was, Minister makes children play in the rain. <laughs> I'm outside too. <laughs> but it was kind of like, you know, so we had the right people in place at the time. And then we had this duty to promote. And then I was given the job of actually delivering on that duty to promote for my final four years in government. And I found out it was a sham because mm. I'm promoting it to you now. And that's it, done. That's all I need to do. So if you've got a duty to promote anything, watch out in any part of your lives. If that word promote comes in, it doesn't require you to deliver a thing. So I then spent the four years of my life as environment, sustainability and housing minister trying to deliver on this duty. So got, getting the politics behind it, getting the whole of cabinet to agree, it would be our central organizing principle. And they did. And the civil service went, great, 
great ministers, yeah, yeah, well, of course we'll help you all the way, but they wouldn't actually change things. So the massive frustration, and there are a few people who've been part of this frustration in this room, the massive frustration was being in a situation whereby the politicians wanted to do this and were not getting support to do this. The politicians were supported by voluntary sector organisations mm. who wanted to yeah. do it and yet were not getting the support. So I decided to leave government and it wasn't about anything anybody had done, but, you know, we were, we were the, um, a new National Assembly. There were only 60 of us. Personally, I wrote a lot at the time about, I didn't think anybody should stand for longer than three terms. And our terms were four years. So I said I was gonna leave after my third term, which is, which, 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 which is what I did. So the whole of my third term, I spent trying to deliver this really, really important duty in terms of changing the way that Wales did business. And it turned out to be impossible because policy will only last an individual administration. Mm. And if you can't guarantee that your policy will move on to the next administration, then you can't guarantee that anything you want to do, even about the most important things facing us, will ever be there in the political framing. And then something really weird happened. And th therefore the reason we have legislation in Wales is thanks to David Cameron. And anybody know what David Cameron did in 2010 in the context of this debate? Well, he did do that, but he cut the Sustainable Development Commission. And we'd had in all the administrations across the whole of the UK, in all political persuasions, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in England, and in Wales, we'd had the Sustainable Development Commission, which had been there for 10 years. Fantastic, non-political experts, able to help us all in how we moved forward. We had the Forum for the Future and a whole range of other organizations helping those of us who was interested. And I went to speak at the 10th anniversary of the Sustainable Development Commission in Bristol. And no minister turned up from the new UK government. And the man from DEFRA had to tell us, all of us, 300 odd people in the room, that actually, by accident almost, the Sustainable Development Commission had been removed because the that government had decided on a one-in, one-out policy in relation to new non-departmental public bodies, and the first casualty was the Sustainable Development Commission. So we have this utter irony where the first casualty is the very body that's helping all the governments in all of the UK to try and think longer term, is helping them on how they, how they do that. And it was literally on the way back from that meeting that I thought, right, we can't carry on like this. I've now had, knowing in Wales we had a duty to promote that meant nothing, knowing that actually we had no external accountability, therefore the civil service in a sense could just drag their feet in delivery and we couldn't do anything about that. And knowing that, therefore, what I would, the legacy I was passing on to the next set of politicians, I may have done the, the plastic bag charge first, but you wouldn't have known that in any par other part of the UK. But within four years, all other parts of the UK followed suit. But the Daily Mail claimed it. Yeah, <laughs> they, never, they never yeah. paid any tribute to Wales. But knowing I might have done that, and I might have got our recycling up, so we're now third best in the world, we might have got a coast path, we might have got a new curriculum, but I was gonna fail on this fundamental duty of actually making sure we had sustainable development at the heart of our actions. So it was literally on the way back from Bristol to Cardiff that I decided we had to have a law, not a policy. And that was my legacy. 
my legacy was that the next person who became first minister was prepared to have a law so that we had a duty to deliver on sustainable development. And as part of that law, all my learning was the law had to be a law that captured the Welsh government. So they had to do it too. The civil service had to do it too. And that is in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. The law had to be a law which applied to all public services in Wales because they're the only ones the Welsh Government was in charge on, and the law, Wellbeing of Future Gen Generations Act does that. The law had to be a law where they were all audited in the same way, because if you audit these things separately, then the auditing doesn't get done. Therefore, that is in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. The Auditor General for Wales governs how all the public bodies are audited. And finally, the law needed an independent commissioner to hold everybody to account. And that was in the Future Generations Act. And we can talk more about all those parts subsequently. And that also, because it was a law, it had to be able to go to the courts, which it can by judicial review. Sorry, would it yeah. help if I stand <laughs> yeah. for those at the back? So we're in a situation now, when I left with those parts agreed in the context of taking a new law. What you won't be surprised to find is that when the next Welsh Government had a look at this and realised their obligations, that they wanted to dismantle all of that. And I understand that because, of course, it's the civil service giving the politicians advice. So the civil service did not now want to be held to account uh, on the basis of a law that was going to change what they had to do. Um, but I'm delighted to say that this was a cross-party victory for the Gov party of government, for Plaid Cymru and the Liberal Democrats. So it wouldn't have happened without David Cameron but of course, that was the negative input. The positive input was all three parties then agreed there should be a law. And as a result of that law, the Welsh Government and all the public services in Wales are now duty bound to deliver well-being outcomes according to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Now that act, Still not, I mean, still in early days, if we're honest, because 2015, um, it was passed, 2016 went into law, they were all required to do well-being plans, then came COVID. So we're only in the second stage of that. One commissioner for seven years has just moved on, and the second commissioner is absolutely focused on implementation, making sure that all those public bodies do what they're meant to be doing under the Act. Now, I'm telling it in, in the way that this is the requirement. People have to do things. You'll all know that even if people have to do things, they don't necessarily do it. And what we do hope is what the Act really is, is the permission to think differently. It's the permission to inspire people to be able to go to their managers and say, you're not doing anything sustainably. You are going to be contrary to this act. And this act needs to become an act for the people of Wales. But essentially the act, because there are at least half this audience doesn't know what the act is, essentially what the act does is it takes that Brundtland definition of sustainable development to make sure that when you make decisions in the present, you don't compromise on the ability of future generations to meet their own needs through four pillars, environment, society, economy, and culture. And that's really important because our cultures decide what we are prepared to do, what behavior change we are prepared to do. And it delivers it through seven goals, which include all aspects of being healthier, being prosperous, while being low carbon.
very important. The word growth does not appear in any of the goals. Woo. So prosperity yeah. as low carbon. Being healthier, not in terms of numbers of doctors, but what are the actions that can be put in place to make people healthier? Being more equal, similarly, how can we support equality, not just in any protected characteristic, and for Wales that explicitly includes transgender, but also in the context of poverty. So it's about how we take all those things that for me have been the value system that brought me into politics under Michael Foote in the Labour Party. It's taking the value system and saying, how can we enhance biodiversity? How can we create prosperity uh, without damaging the planet with fossil fuels? It, how can we, when we take any global action, we can't offshore it either because when we take any global action, we have to behave as we would have done in Wales. So the act is a really, really exciting act. And what I'm also very excited by is the fact that I'm working with 12 countries across the world. We may be the first, but I think that Scotland was due to be second, but a little bit um, uh, awry <laughs> at the moment in terms of the timetable. But Ireland is going to do an act like this. New Zealand is, wants to pass an act like this. Um, also, all those countries involved in um, the kind of well-being economies, you know, Iceland, <coughs> Denmark, etc., they're really interested. I'm doing a lot of work in individual states in America, provinces in Canada. And I do all this work absolutely free because this is about proselytizing about a value system. We need to have a value system guiding our politics because we've lost that. Or if we have it, it's the most negative, monetized, extractive value system, which is what we've just seen from the UK government. And Donella Meadows said back in 1972 when she published Limits for Growth, if we treat the world as though it has no limits, the answer is collapse. If we treat the world as though there are limits, but we're going to get everything out within a short period of time, the answer is collapse. The only way we get a sustainable future is if we're cooperative, if we're collaborative, if we think long term, if we're preventative, if we involve people about whom decisions are being made. Now, I've slightly reframed that last one because those five things I've just said, being collaborative, uh, integrating outcomes, thinking long term, being preventative and involving people about whom decisions are made, they're also on the face of the act. So all our public services in Wales are basically struggling to find out how they do this and how they reach those goals. And that is something we all need to encourage not only them to do, but when other countries pick this up, I said culture was really important. And what the importance of culture is the fact that this is not Wales telling other countries what to do. After all, we're not even a UN member state. But this is Wales sharing the learning. It's Wales sharing how hard it is, how long it takes. That curriculum that I started in 2003 in terms of active, curious learners making sure they have time outside, thinking about climate, thinking about things in areas of learning rather than subjects, uh, finishing with a baccalaureate, not the traditional narrow systems, that came into law last year in Wales. And the whole curriculum now reflects that in Wales. But that's from 2003 to 2023, a 20-year journey. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I'd stayed as a politician for both those things, they wouldn't have happened because when I was the politician responsible for both those things, everything comes to you. And actually this has to be cooperative. This has to be collaborative. This has to be about next generation politicians signing it up for two, getting involved in all of this. And some of you were here yesterday to hear about something else that we were able to do while I was still a politician, One Planet Developments. Look up the One Planet Council because 
I pay, absolutely pay tribute to the One Planet developers. And Freya's here who gave a, a, a part of the, uh, the um, conversation with Matt yesterday about their one just down the road from here. The point about it is, is they are living zero carbon lives. They are getting an income off their land because they're required to in this policy. Most of these take place on peripheral sheep grazing ground. So we are able to demonstrate that you can get incomes off any land of some way if you find the right um, skill, if you find the right opportunity for your business model. And they're only in Wales. There's massive interest in them uh, elsewhere, including in some of the counties in England, which are looking at this at the, at the moment. But it's really worth reading this report because this report tells you how to increase biodiversity in your own garden. <laughs> it's not just about doing it in a one planet development, but they are required to get a baseline study. So then they can see what they do and how it matters. And that is one of the best ways in getting people on a new page is when they can see the outcomes. And yeah, 13 acre small holding, we only manage about an acre of it because we manage an acre for food. And everything else is about how we can maximize biodiversity, tree planting, uh, etc. And I was asked a question about net zero, and I haven't even got there. So quickly, <laughs> if you assume all the principles I've just described uh, in terms of how Wales moves forward as a value system, I was asked last year by the leaders of both the Welsh Government and Plaid Cymru, and that's really important, cross-party approach. Two-thirds of the members in what is now a full Welsh Parliament with uh, primary lawmaking powers asked me to advise them on could we reach net zero by 2035, not 2050. Mm. I accelerate it by 15 years in a fair, just and nature positive way. Now, I, I don't know whether it can be done, but I can tell you I've assembled the most amazing group of people to help me. There's a website, Wales Net Zero 2035. We're inviting open evidence. We're doing it through a series of challenges. There was a, there was a, a piece of paper on the front of this uh, tent yesterday that said the big emission reductions were, uh, need to be in food, in transport, in buildings and energy. And we're putting challenges out in all of those sequentially for people to put evidence in. We want to see how we get the quantifiable emissions reduction, but we want to do it fairly. And we believe fundamentally that a government's job is to protect its people. And I think that, that there could not be a more different approach to government at the moment in the last week between where the government of Wales and Plaid Cymru, because this is a formal cooperation agreement, see their responsibilities, and where the UK government sees its responsibilities to trash everybody's, including their own future. It's a most extraordinary situation we find ourselves in. So we're taking evidence at the moment. We've got underpinning academic um, work because this has to be really serious so that we're taken seriously and if we are successful what what we will have by next summer is the outcome of a citizens assembly a number of partnerships that have worked with a range of organizations including um, the Hay Festival for example in, in, but including local government including School of International Futures including Hawkwood College a range of other partners who will test whether or not our ideas are of interest with a much wider population. But the Citizens' Assembly will be really important because it will be properly done. It will not be done by us, it will be done by another organisation, but it will be properly done in terms of sortition and ensuring that we get the clear outcomes from it, which will influence our final work. That will come out in uh, summer next year, and it needs to because in September, in Wales, everybody goes into budget discussions and the cooperation agreement finishes in December. And I wouldn't normally be laying out a timeline like this, but the importance of it is, this is a Goldilocks moment in Wales in terms of an opportunity. 
and you have to seize those moments. So if we can demonstrate 10-year pathways from 2025 to 2035, demonstrate what needs to happen in each of those years according to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, we will create a model that maybe other countries could also start following because we can't find anybody who's got a 10-year pathway. And isn't that terrifying when you're sitting here now? We cannot find, we can find lots of people who say it must be done by 2030, but not with a route to it or must be done by 2050. And then, of course, there will not be a route to it because people won't start it till 2040. So we're trying to accelerate that debate and actually being the only country in the world with the legislation is really helpful in others looking to us for where this potentially could go. So I do apologise about sort of doing a timetable and I'm going to do two more bits of it before we do questions. And one, one of those is that we want those two political parties to put this in the budget. I'm the only person who's got any political background who's on our group because it's deliberately want to be cross-party political. This is collaborative, preventative, long-term thinking, involving people about whom uh, decisions are being made and integrating the goals. So we're doing that in our ways of working for our work, as well as what we want to achieve in the outcomes. And if all is well, we would expect things to be in the budget from 2024, or from 2025 onwards, the next budget, we would expect it to influence the Welsh manifestos in 2026, but we had hoped people would use our work, such as you, uh, uh, both in Wales and across the UK, in the context of the likely UK general election in 2025. So there is a, a moment, a moment, where if we seize it and can do it well enough, what we could get out of this is an agreement between the Welsh Government and Plaid Cymru, that in their manifestos, they both propose we bring the legislative target forward from 2050 to 2035. And that would, I hope, um, make sure that others did something similar. Mm -hmm. So we're talking to the few countries of the world that have got their own legislative targets. Finland uh, is one, for example. And we're really interested, but anybody here in this room has anything to put into this, particularly around emissions reduction, particularly around pathways, then please get in touch with me directly, get in touch through the website. Um, the opportunity is there. And perhaps if I stop there, go That's for great. questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Another example of Wales doing it first. Can I just get a sense of who lives in Wales from here? Woo! Yeah, so it's quite a good audience. Okay, good. That's really good. Great. So I have one question to kind of kick us off, but really this is about your debate and what you want to put into it. So good. I've seen your hand first. I'm going to do my question, then I'll come to you. Um, we have no mics. Please stand up and shout. Um, so, Jane, what, I suppose what I want to ask, and I used to work at the Sustainable Development Commission, so I've been in this game a long yeah. time too, and um, what I'm aware of, like every other area of policy, sustainability suffers from the kind of ambition practice kind of gap. Mm. And so I'm interested to know from you, what do you feel like the main obstacles that are in your way at the moment when you are setting out on this audacious task uh, for 2035? What, you know, what's the problem? You've talked about the absence of 10-year uh, plans. That sounds really important. It sounds mm. like those st that stuff's being developed. Say a little bit about, you know, your wish list, I guess. But. Yeah, I mean, I think, oddly enough, I think, I think the obstacles in Wales are fewer now than they were when the legislation was first passed, which is actually a really positive testimony. Oh, that was one of my questions. To That's it. great. Um, <laughs> I'm really glad to And in that. fact, when um, Sophie Howe, the first commissioner, the way, the way it's set up is a commissioner can only have one go. <laughs> so it's a seven year go and it's deliberately seven years. So it crosses two administrations. Um, so a commissioner can only, only have one go. And when the outgoing commissioner um, actually did a report on how well Welsh government had delivered, uh, her, basically it was kind of B plus. You know, there was a lot of, there, there was ambition and there was leadership 
and there was commitment, but there weren't yet the processes in place right. to actually ensure that all the public the sector organisations right. you know, had the machinery to really help them deliver, which is why it's really important that the second commissioner, um, who's been in place since January, is really going to be focused on, on implementation. But I, I think it's worth just giving just two or three examples. I mean, some of you will know that um, uh, this is always a, 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 an example that divides people, but I'm completely on the side of the government on this one. There has been a 25-year plan um, to uh, uh, build extra lanes in the M4 and to get rid of the Newport tunnels. And business has argued for that year after year after year. And all the way through my life in, 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 in government, and the, the 12 years I was minister, I just kept thinking, this is a sort of nonsense. Why, mm. why would you just facilitate um, 17 miles of the M4 and damage all the environment in the process. But it kept being in manifestos, including in, in our own party manifesto, because there were more people who wanted it than not. And um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, the first significant thing that happened was the first minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, turned that down. And in, then he turned it down on environmental grounds. And the, uh, and the fact that the SSSI would have been um, effect, uh, affected very badly. But also, it was a really important signal about looking at a whole other way of looking at issues around transport. Um, so I also have to say that Welsh Government has 40% less funding now than it had when I was a, um, when I was a minister. Um, some of that is to do with the fact that the UK government is trying to bypass the Welsh government. Um, it's handing money straight to local authorities, the post-Brexit money, for example. Um, the, the, the real iniquity, though, is Welsh government should have got about five billion out of what is turning out to be the failed H HS2 because it doesn't even come to Wales. And it's had nothing because they decided that crew was close enough to Wales to benefit Wales. So, you know, the way the UK government behaves in the context of devolution is hugely important here. So the big ambitions that Wales had about transport are largely on hold because they're very infrastructure heavy and therefore they were relying on that HS2 money to make them, make, make them happen. So, much as I love Wales, and, and I'm delighted that, that this is standing the test of time, there are lots of issues about being the poorest part in the UK and having very little mm. money yeah. in terms of taking action. 40% is really striking. But I think the one other, the one other wow. point in is that now things that were really hard to do years ago just sail through. So years and years ago, I was one of the, of the three politicians who actively wanted to ban smacking in Wales, and we couldn't get it through. And it sailed through <laughs> mm. after the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Mm. You know, so it, this is not just environmental. I think it's really important that it's, yeah. it's about society. And one of the most exciting things, some of you will be aware that Wales has a universal basic income pilot, not just, not for a standard sector of the population, but for the group who have the most disadvantaged outcomes care leavers at the age of 18 and so Wales is doing this pilot with them at the moment and that that would never have been able to take place without the well-being of future generations that so you've got this I, now the value system is guiding very different policy making in Wales not supported by all parties explicitly <laughs> not by one party <laughs> Okay, so this is striking stuff, actually. Um, so we've got one question, but uh, before you, sir, I just want to check that there isn't a young person here who wants to ask a question. Can I, yeah, can I have your hand? If you wouldn't mind standing up and shouting, that'd be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, Hi, yeah, so I um, actually work for the local authority in Gwent. Um, and I just wanted to, wanted to be aware of the local area energy planning that's going on across Wales at the moment. So um, each local authority in Wales is having a plan made on how we can Organise our energy system, looking at transport. Um, there's going to be local systems. There's going to be a regional system and a national system as well. Um, 
but I know that they're not thinking about 2035, it's all about 2050. Yeah. Mm. And I think one of the big blockers that we're facing is to do with like the grid, um, but also generally skills. Yeah. So skills right. blockages that we're having, not just in terms of our energy systems, but everything that we need to do to help decarbonize. And I guess I just want to know what your thoughts on how we can kind of drive through building mm. skills in those areas where we need to yeah, That's and great question, thank yeah. you, because I realised I didn't tell you what the other group was <laughs> on my... <laughs> so it's the four big emitters, and the other group is um, education and the future of work. And that is all about how we get the right skills in place. I've just written to every local authority chief executive, um, and of course, with the support of Welsh Government um, and, and Plaid Cymru, this group, gives us a very um, important authoritative status in going to the local authorities. So I've written to all, all of them last week to say, we want to know what you're going to do by 2035. So we are going to, and, and we're asking for the most ambitious planning as well. Uh, we know that some authorities are much more ambitious than others, and they'll be ambitious in different areas as well. So it, we know that some authorities are being really ambitious about energy. Um, Swansea's one, for example, Pembrokeshire's another. Um, so we're really interested in how we take the most ambitious and then try and raise that game again. So our um, evidence taking is sequential. You know, we, we took evidence on food. It's still open, Gerald, if you haven't responded, but our food evidence and anybody here wants to put, put in evidence on food, that's open to the middle of this month. Um, energy has opened and buildings is just about to open. We're doing it sequentially so that we can actually uh, look at how each of these interrelates with each other and then we've got a separate domains group which is actually going to look at risk, regulation, opportunity and I'm in touch with the chief executive of the National Grid who'd like to do something in Wales um, linked to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and that's not the chief executive in the UK, that's Paula Reynolds in Seattle who read my book and got in touch with me and I've just put I put my book here next to Kim Stanley Robinson. I don't know who put Kim's book up. It will be shame. Or Stan, as he's... Yeah, Stan, as he's normally known. He got in touch with me. And I did, a, I did an, uh, an interview with him. So there's an interview between me and Stan in 2020. So little old Wales is getting this kind of interest. But we're really interested. Anything that you want to be really ambitious about on energy, we'd really like to know about it. Your question, please. If you could stand up and shout, that'd be great. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Jane. What you shared with us um, rationally and uh, passionately, um, I'm fully subscribed to, and I'm sure most people in this room would be as well. But uh, unfortunately, there is a slice, a large slice, of the UK media which is antagonistic towards um, the whole notion of climate change and, and objectives that need to be made to. to slow it down and, mm. and stop it and um, I just feel that uh, <coughs> you know I'm dismayed sometimes that the political parties and I, 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 and I talk about the full range um, tend to uh, find themselves at the mercy giving clickbait to the hostile elements of the media uh, and I wish that the political parties and particularly the politicians in Lead, taking lead on these matters, but generally in, in climate change, did not expose themselves through personal and professional behaviour in terms of how they travel and what they do. I think they've got a higher yeah. obligation <laughs> not to feed easy stories to the Daily Mail and the Telegraph and mm. the Daily Express and the Sun. Um, but look, this is how they do it. They're telling us not to, but look what they're doing. And he's, you know, and, and that, it's just so simple, and yet it gets people off the hook. And unless all this, what you've said today, lands in the broad population, then it makes it more difficult for political parties to actually gain support for the difficult things that we've got to put up with in the future, which isn't really that apparent to a lot of people. Mm. So I think there needs to be more discipline, and people just used to need to behave in a, in a way that they don't get caught out with easy stories in the, in the way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a really important point. I mean, I, I, my credibility, such as it is, comes from walking, walking the walk as well as talking the talk. 
I haven't flown for a holiday since 2007. Um, we live as low carbon alive as lives as we possibly can. Um, and that's been really deliberate. And, and that does help because it means that you can't be easily attacked. But actually, I still will have a higher footprint than somebody living in a flat in London. So I do think that we've got to also educate people about which, which elements contribute mm. to, towards it. And I am flying for the first time for a holiday in Malaysia in October this year because it's my son's wedding <laughs> and he's marrying a Malaysian girl, you know. So I think there's also um, teaching people about what you can do in the context of um, recompense. I, I always try and avoid using the word offset, but, you know, kind of recompense so that the actions that you take to make sure that in your own personal carbon, carbon budgeting that actually you do that. And what's really interesting in that, I actually put a piece out this morning, is that at 68% of people in Britain are perfectly happy with the idea of a frequent flyer tax. Mm. All right, in principle. But that goes down to only half of those when they realize what it will mean, because of course, it's so well subsidized. And really, we have to really go for governments doing these subsidies. And we have to be absolutely clear that the, these are the secret things that go into fossil fuel support. We don't call them out enough. We tend to go for the companies, but we've got to go for the governments. Yeah. Because the governments can change that. Yeah. And if there's enough pressure on that, or if people feel that actually, you know, most people feel that flying's not a bad thing if they only do it once a year. And that might well be fine if they, in terms of other things they do in their lives. I've chosen not to do it like that, but I said my son's getting married in Mex uh, sorry in, in um, Malaysia, and my daughter's getting married in Mexico next year. I'm going to that too, and then I'll go back to my no flying. Okay, well, but I'm it's going to speed it up know, a little bit, but just it shows I really want to get some how difficult in. it is. So um, I've got quite a few questions. Oh, sorry. So if you I'll could go first, short. and then you, and then yeah. you. So thank you for a brilliant talk. I just wanted to plug that um, the talks that are here. If you wish your friends had seen this talk, it is possible. We're putting them up on the Green Gathering. Um, YouTube channel, please subscribe to it. Please share these links to your friends. The first place in five days are already up there. Um, and put them out on your social media so that everyone that's not fortunate enough to come to the festival can see these things as well. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. And thank you for making that happen. Yeah. <laughs> We've been trying to do that for years, and Zoe, who's incredibly busy, another incredibly busy woman, has managed to drive that through. Okay, um, you please, and then you. Short questions, short answers. Okay, two questions. Are you talking to the National Labour Party? Because they don't seem to be talking about mm, anything. This, great question. Hate true huggers. And secondly, are you talking to the UN? Um, both. <laughs> Great. <laughs> nice. Please. So thank you for your patience. Um, I'm sorry to those that didn't get to ask questions. Thank you for turning out and uh, for listening. Let's give Jane a round of applause and then if you want to take questions <laughs> <laughs>